Hello. Hi, Maylee. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Okay. This new version will not uh, cut us off after 40 minutes. So we can do an hour session. Although I still stand by my uh, recommendation that you go to half hour sessions. That's what I recommend as well. What's that? I like that idea. Okay. Um, and um, I'll let you take care of that or your mother rather. What happened? What, I missed that. What happened? Uh, I, I upgraded Zoom so that I can certainly do hour long sessions now. Okay. But I'm still recommending that May Lee go to half hour sessions. Oh, okay. Uh, two half hour sessions a day as opposed to one hour session. And okay. I will let you take care of that and decide on that. I'm not going to do anything uh, on my end. Uh, you can schedule it whenever you want. Ideally, uh, like a half hour in the morning, half hour in the afternoon would be great. Put some time in between. Yeah, that's um, great. But I will let you do that. And if you can't fit it into the schedule nicely, I'm happy to keep doing hour long sessions. There's no problem. Okay. Um, so when you try to do it on Booksy, it doesn't let you do it in half hours. So it only like lets you do it in hours. Well, choose the half hour session that says free. Oh, okay. I got you. Uh, okay. it, that uh, is something I still haven't quite figured out with Booksy. Uh, it's new. Okay. Um, they bought out Go to Meeting, which I, or not Go to Meeting, GenBook, which I used to use. Okay. And uh, I haven't been able to figure out how to expand my categories. But uh, you can certainly pick the half hour session and then just pay 16 for it. Okay. Um, yeah, I charge exactly half. So, okay. All right. Let's start on the rest of these problems. We left off yesterday with that A cubed plus A squared plus AB. What number was that? That was 16. Hold on, let me turn to it because I was looking at her homework that she needs to turn in online. Uh huh. I identified. Hold on a second. Can you, can you try and help me with the homework? I identified that can you try and help number 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 25 are part of her real homework that she has to turn in. Okay. So let's start on 17. Let's do that right now. Those right now. Yeah. All right. Hold on a second. I got to close my office door here. This is what I just circled. This is the one that you're going to need help with. This is the PMT I went through. This is the actual problem. Maybe this is the actual problem. Okay. Hello. Yep. She's saying that she wants to actually, you know, share her screen and do the homework with you online. Is that possible? Uh, it is. Um, it's not what I recommend, but um, the, the, because the ones that I just pointed out to you, they the exact same problem. So I think we should just go ahead. We'll try it this way this yeah. time with um, going through the book because yeah. it is exactly the same. I went through and took screen. I, I, I can teach her math better if I'm interacting with her yeah. as opposed to letting her do problems on her own on paper and then showing it to me. Uh, it no, I just, think she wanted you to do it, you know, for her. Like she just shares the screen oh. and you write on it, I guess. I don't well, know. that's fine. I'll write on my screen and then she can just copy. I am recording this and hopefully I have the sound solved also now. Uh, so she's welcome to look at this file to see how to do these problems mm -hmm. um, from the recording, or as we go through these problems, she can see what I'm writing and she can write it on her paper if she wants. But I really want her to be able to verbalize it to me when I'm asking her questions. Uh, it keeps her engaged. 
And that's the most important thing you can do when teaching math. Insane. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So let's bring you on. Mm -hmm. Let's start with 17. Use your pencil. This is the exact one. Quick now, um, what these following problems are are word problems that end up using polynomials to model the situation. And this first one, <coughs> the polynomial that they use. It uses the variable t, and it uses some initial velocity, which in this case is t, which is going to make this term go away. But nonetheless, they still start with that. And they basic, basically want to know what happens. Uh, you, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and call this what it actually is which is the height as a function of t. Why they left that off, I have no idea. And the information, if she's trying to determine how deep the well is, then she plugs in the numbers that they've given her here. Her height, she plugs in six feet for h. For T, she plugs in three and a half seconds. And so here is what you have. The total depth of the well, which I'm going to call height, because that's the way it's typically called, um, is, and I'm going to use this notation, because this is why we use H of T instead of Y is that because you can actually plug the variable in and that tells you what to do after that. And so I'm gonna substitute six immediately for that. So this polynomial actually becomes that right off the get go. And this term, because it's multiplied by zero disappears. So really this is the only thing left and as all you have to do is plug in 3.5 for T and you will get an answer. So minus 16 times 3.5 squared plus six. Now do that in your calculator. Okay. And the first thing to do is that one. It, the simplest way to do it in a calculator is to get that number and then multiply it by minus 16, or just 16, and know that your answer is going to be minus. Um, but if you put this, the minus 16 in first, then you got to use parentheses. Make sure that you your 3.5 is in parentheses squared. So it's really easier to just do the square part first, and then um, multiply that result by minus 16. And then add six. And what do you get when you do that? Uh, equals. What's the equal sign? Plus six. Got, Plus got, six. I, doesn't I really shouldn't be using an equal sign. Is all she needs to do is this part of it, okay. and and then equals. <laughs> Thank you. You don't want to use the equal sign first. Well, what? Six. Stop. Can you stop, Manly, please? I think she got it. Okay. What'd she get for an answer? I, I don't I don't know what the answer is, but I can certainly approximate it. This number is almost it's negative nine. No nine. Yeah. I said negative one nine. Negative 190. Okay, just a second. I'm just going to check that my calculator. Seems a little bit off. So, no, no, that's probably right. Yeah. Times 16 equals 196. Negative 90. Yeah. 
Now, we got a negative sign because the height is negative. In other words, it's a well. Why they would start you off on this subject going down, I don't know. The typical way to teach this problem is you throw a ball up into the air and what is the height of it? And when you use that model, there is an initial speed that you throw the ball up into the air. So it is a little different when you drop a ball down a well and that the initial speed is always zero. So it, it wipes out that middle term. And I suppose that makes it a little bit easier to calculate the answer. You didn't have a middle term with a T in there. But yeah, this is uh, all there is to that problem. And most of these word problems are going to be pretty straightforward like that. They, they won't be really difficult to figure out. It's pretty much you substitute the information they give you into the polynomial that they give you. Okay? Okay. Let's look at 18. Uh, 18's a little different, um, but 18's pretty easy also. So we have artists who use square canvases, and that's important because they're going to give us the height later, and it's important that we know that the width is the same as the height. So the fact that they're using square canvases is important. Claire uses this polynomial to charge for her paintings. And Richard uses this polynomial to charge for his paintings, where x is the height of each of their squares. Uh, they use different squares. They don't use the same square. They use different squares. Well, maybe. They could use the same square. But she charges based on this. Okay, if the height is uh, one foot, then she's going to charge 50 plus 250. If his height is one, then she's going to charge, he's going to charge 40 plus 350. So he make more money for smaller paintings. But when you get bigger paintings, then that 50 times a bigger square, she'll start making more money. So depending on the size of the painting, um, that will determine who makes the most on their paintings. So first of all, let's talk about how much does Claire charge? Well, they've given us the polynomial right there, but they've only given us one side of an equation, which I really detest. I don't know why they're doing that. Let's put the charge. That's Claire's charge as a function of X equals 50 X squared plus 250. You almost never encounter polynomials all on their own. You always encounter them as part of an equation where there is an equal sign and the other side of it, this is how much she charges. And it's based on, it's a function of X. The bigger X is, the more she charges, okay? And maybe I should even call that um, Claire's charge. So we'll call it CC. And that is exactly correct. And so what would Richard's charge be? We know it's a function of X. What is it? 40 parentheses, five. You don't need the, uh, you're getting ahead of it. Let's do it step by step. His function, um, okay. Uh, actually, you're not getting ahead of it. Um, what I really needed to do here was go ahead and substitute the number because hers is six, his is five. five. So let's finish hers. What does she charge? When you substitute six for X, what do you get? And then multiply it by 50 and then add 250 to it. 
Yeah, put uh, squared. Yeah, it's, in other words, after I've substituted, here, let me go ahead and write it all out. It's 50 times six squared plus 250. In other words, the beauty of function notation is that whatever is in the parentheses gets substituted for the variable, always. No matter whether it's a variable itself, still gets substituted. So you need to be able to do that in your calculator, and you want to do it without having to retype anything. So the way to do it is start with the exponential, 6 squared which gives you 36. And now without retyping anything, just do times 50. That will give you another answer. What's that answer? 36 times 50. 36 times 50. Well, I want you to do it the way I told you. Do six squared. And it should show 36 on your calculator. Yeah. Now do times 50. Don't retype 36, just do times 50. You won't go get that calculator. No. What do you get? 1,800. And then do plus 250. fifty. So that's what she charges for a six foot painting, a six foot square painting. And now let's do Richard. So it, Richard's, I won't write out the function, but his is five squared plus 350. Yeah, yeah, five squared. So do it the same way, do five squared first. I got 1,350. So 25, yeah, that's correct. So notice that he, she makes, more of course okay. her painting was a little bigger it was six foot but uh so that would stand to reason it would be kind of nice well i guess we're going to find that out in the next part of the question to the nearest tenth for what height will both claire and richard charge the same amount well what they're saying is is where what value of x is that going to be equal to his charge? And they're asking us to solve for x. Okay. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to take the two functions and set them equal to each other, the two polynomials. So the first polynomial is 50 x squared plus 250. That's what Claire charges. And we're going to set that equal to what Richard charges, which is 40 x squared. We need the x squared here. And we don't want to substitute a number in for that. Because once we have this, we can solve that pretty easily. Yep. Um, how do we solve it? Because you and I haven't talked a whole lot about solving equations. Now's a good time. Because you can't really do much with this unless you know how to solve this equation. So what's the first thing to think about? You're looking at uh, a variable and a number. And all the variables you see are x squared. So they're like variables. So this is the point of an equation where you want to gather all your like terms together and make sure your variables are all on one side and your numbers are all on the other. So which side should we put the variables on, the left or the right? And you can do either one, but what makes the most sense for this problem? Mm, probably the left side. Okay. So how do I move this 40x squared to the left side? You subtract it. Okay, so subtract 40x squared, subtract 40x squared. We end up with in terms of x squared. Uh, uh, 10x squared. Okay, and then since we put our x's on the 
left side, we want to put that number, we want to move it over to the right side. And we do that by subtracting. So uh, 350 minus 250 is 100. And now what's the next step in solving this equation? We want the final line to be X equals something. So we got to get rid of everything that's not X. Well, we got a 10. How do we get rid of the 10? The 10, uh, okay, so the 10 we can turn it into a fraction. No? No. What is the, here's the way to do it. What is the 10 doing right now? It's multiplying, correct? Yes. So you get rid of it by doing the opposite by dividing. Just like the way I got rid of this 250, which was being added, was to do the opposite, subtract. And that's the way you solve all equations. You start with the X and a bunch of stuff with it that you don't want, and you gradually get rid of each of it. So the first thing to get rid of is the 10, and you do that by dividing both sides by 10. And that gives you over here on the right, x squared is left on the left, and 10 is on the right. And now how do I solve this? I got to get rid of the square or the two exponent. How do I get rid of that? With the radical. What? With a radical. You take the square root. You do the opposite. And what's the opposite of squaring something? Taking the square root. So if I take the square root of both sides, I will end up with x on the left, and I will end up with the square root of 10 on the right. And since they ask for the answer to the nearest 10th, they don't want it as a radical. They want it as a decimal. It'd be a better math problem if this was the answer. Square root of 10, that's exact and precise. Once you round it off to a decimal, it's going to be an approximation. It's going to be 3.2. Three, what was the full answer? 3.2 what? The full answer is like 3. I need to know the next digit to make sure you rounded okay. it off correct. Maylee, what's the next digit? 3.2 what? Uh, 3. After we do it, because I cleared it. Oh. Okay, so. Six. How much? Go back, Maylee. That's not what it says. Read what it says. 3.16. Okay. 3.16. Yeah. Okay. So you rounded it off on your own, which is fine. I don't have any problems with that, but I'm not looking at your calculator, so I couldn't tell that you'd done it correctly. And when you round this off, it does end up being 3.2. But always make sure you round it, that you don't just drop extra decimals places. Um, okay, so that was a pretty complicated problem for everything we've done up until now. I don't ever remember having to solve an equation that involved an x squared term in it, and solving that always involves at some point you have to take the square root of it. And so when the height of each painting is 3.2 feet, they both would make exactly the same amount, whatever that is. And they don't, they don't even ask for what they would make. That just, we know that when it's 3.2 feet square, uh, they will each make the same amount. All right. 
And when both Claire and Richard charge the same amount for a painting, how much does each charge? Okay, well, I would have done myself a favor if I would have kept going. Uh, let's go back and do Claire. And we know that it's 3.2, right? So this is what Claire is going to make. And we already know that Richard's going to make the same thing because that's how we got the 3.2. So now let's get an answer on that. Uh, they didn't ask you to round it off. So I'm assuming that whatever number you come up with, we want to just write it. So you do it the same in your calculator. You square the 3.2 first. Go to your calculator. Two squared. No, it's 3.2 squared. Yeah, that's why I said. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Sorry. That's all I heard was two squared times 50 plus 250 i already did the plus 250 no you didn't plus 250 it's going to be about 850 in that ballpark how much it's wrong. If he said it was 850 and I got 762, then it's wrong. Okay. Well, 762. Yeah, I was just doing it in my head. Uh, let me check that. My calculator 3.2 times 3.2 equals that times 50 equals that plus 250 okay. equals 762. So now, before we go on, I want to I want to point out something that's actually pretty valuable in math, and that is round off error. This is not what she makes when they make the same. What she actually makes, if we include that second decimal, I want you to do this math. 3.16, which is what it came out to be, you rounded it up to 3.2, but just do that and tell me how much difference there is. And this is the, this is the more accurate answer. It's also not exact because it's only out to two decimal places. But what, what number do you get when you do this? Can I do that? Uh... You can do it on a calculator. No, it's three point one six squared. I know. That's the same fifty as you added two fifty. No, you didn't do that right. You had to multiply it times fifty first. But you didn't multiply. This is not going to be the same answer. You got to multiply mm -hmm. this first before you add. That's no. correct. That's why I'm having you do it so many times because no. no. it's the same process Clear. every time. Clear everything. You have to do, follow PEMDAS. Yes. Okay. You can't just go ahead. In other words, do your parentheses and exponents first. And that works the best in the calculator too. That way you don't have to retype stuff. Seven hundred and forty-nine point three. Pretty big difference. This is the more correct answer. So they really do not make the same when it's 3.2. If they use a more accurate answer, they only make 749 or closer to 750. And that's round off error. And that's the problem with rounding off stuff in, in real life physical problems where you, you know, have to measure stuff. Uh, you want it as accurate as possible because it really does make quite a significant difference. Uh, this is a $12, $13 difference between the two. Just because they had you round off to the nearest 10th 
as opposed to rounding off to the nearest hundred. And it would have been more accurate still had you gone out and rounded it off to the nearest thousands. Um, been a lot more accurate. So, you know what's so funny is that in the book the uh -huh. answer is seven fifty. So they used the exact number. They did. Look at that. Yeah, they didn't ah, round it off. They, they, they trapped us by this to the nearest tenth. See, they shouldn't do yeah, that. Yeah, you should have just used. Uh -huh. the I don't like doing that anyway. I my answer would have been square root of ten squared, or whatever. Yeah. No, yeah, it was the square root of 10 squared, and that would have been exactly 50, yeah. or 10 times 50 is 500. So the actual, the exact answer is 750. Exactly. That's exactly what yeah. it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah. So actually, that really is significant. I'm glad you brought that up, because I wanted to use the exact answer, which is square root of 10. And when you square that, there is no round off error. In other words, if I do it like this and don't convert that to a decimal, square root of 10 squared is 10. Mm -hmm. So it's exactly 50 times 10 plus 250. Mm -hmm. um, and it shows you the problems when you round off, particularly early. You, it's okay to round off your final answer because at some point in time, you have to measure out the size of these paintings or whatever. But... You don't want to round off stuff mid problem because that round off just magnifies itself. As we saw here, it gave us 762 because we rounded off early. All right. Yeah. You have what? You have a question? Actually, never mind. I forget the question answer. Um, always up for questions. That actually really is the most important thing you can do on your end is when you don't understand something 100%, please ask a question. That's the whole benefit of one-on-one -on -one tutoring is that you get to ask questions when you don't understand something exactly. All right. If we look at 19. It's another real life problem where they're giving us a polynomial that's going to represent the number of bacteria. Um, when the temperature of the colony is 20 degrees, and then it's a different polynomial when the colony grows to be 30 degrees. So the rate that this bacteria colony increases is dependent on the temperature. It's guess what? Why you refrigerate food? <laughs> because when it's colder, it does not increase as much. When it's warmer, if you leave food out of the refrigerator, the bacteria grows much faster. Okay. So after one minute, okay, will the population be greater in colony at 20 degrees or 30 degrees? Well, the only way to answer this is to figure out what the number is. And what I really wish they would do here is let's call the number of bacteria that. They don't even mention it, but that is a polynomial. And for 20 degrees, it is this. It's T squared plus 4T plus 4. And they're saying after one minute, that means T is one. So what I want to figure out is what is N of one? Well, tell me what I need to write over here on the right. Uh, T, uh, T two. <laughs> no, you're going to substitute whatever is in the parentheses every time you encounter a T. You're going to substitute one for it. Okay. So what do I need to write? And and write everything out. Don't do any math in your head. Okay. Uh, one squared. Okay. Plus, uh, let's say five. Uh, five. Five. No. This is four. Tell me to write. I want you to write it out. I don't want you to do any math. It's four, four times one. Four times one. 
And that's how you write that. I, I can write it with a dot, but I prefer to use parentheses. When you get up into a certain level of algebra, it's parentheses is what means multiplication. Plus four, and then let's simplify that. In other words, it's very important when you're first learning this stuff to just plug it directly in without doing any math. Because if you try to do this two steps in one or three steps in one, it inevitably leads to mistakes. So this becomes this, and now you can get the answer without much trouble. Okay, what's one plus four plus four? Uh, nine. Okay, so I am going to make this equal nine. And, and then we have to do the same thing for the 30 degree. Well, at 30 degrees, I'm gonna use the same letter because we're still talking about the number of bacteria and it's still a function of time, only it's a different polynomial. This one is T squared plus three T plus four. And so now if you do N of one over here, I guess I do, I should use a different letter here. Let's call this um, warmer N. So I'll use W. Um, just because the number of bacteria, this N is not really the same as this N down here. So I wanna use a different letter, but it's still a function of T. And they're still saying after one minute. So again, plug in, tell me what to write. Okay, so uh, for W, three, uh, okay, what was one squared plus three times one plus four. Simplify. Simplify, it's just the one plus three plus four, which is seven, eight. All right. Those are the correct answers. The only thing is, is that I we may have our temperatures backwards, but we don't. They're the ones that have it bad. Because according to this, there's more bacteria at a lower temperature than there is at a higher temperature, which does not make any sense um, with the real world. We know that that's not true. We know that when the temperature is higher, bacteria grows faster. So even after one minute, there should be more bacteria at 30 degrees than 20. But we can't help it. Uh, I've reread the problem and that clearly applies to 20 degrees. And this clearly applies to 30 degrees. So we've used the formulas or the polynomials that they've told us to use, and we got the correct answer. It's just not one that matches what we know in real life to be the truth. Uh, and I don't know, maybe after, who knows? Maybe they are right, that after a minute doesn't, uh, no. Does it matter that they put T represents time in seconds? No, not, not at all. Uh, oh, yeah, actually it doesn't. Yes, thank you. I missed that, totally. Yeah, because they trapped us. They made the units on time in seconds and then they said after a minute. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we need to go back and do that. So for the 20 degree one, it's, 60 seconds, so that's gonna equal 60 squared plus four times 60 plus four. Do that in your calculator. Okay. 60 squared. Thanks for catching that, Tracy. And that will solve our problem. Because when you square a number, uh, 
No, it won't. Uh, we're still going to get a smaller number. So that doesn't change anything. But it does give us the correct answer, which I did not have before. Maybe you, OK, so here's the problem here. You didn't close the parentheses. I didn't? Oh. No. So that's why your number is off. Okay. Here's probably, if you're doing this on a calculator, it's really easy to make a mistake. So what I do is a second step here. I know that 60 squared is 3,600. And I know that four times 60 is 240 that's plus good. four. And now it's much easier to do that without making a mistake. Yeah. 3,844. Yeah. Okay, and now let's go back and do it properly for the 30 degree one. And this is the warmer one. And it's still 60 squared plus three times 60. So it's still gonna be a smaller number, um, but that's 3,600 plus 180 plus four. So that is going to be 3784. So they still have the colder temperature as having more bacteria. Um, so it didn't make a difference in that regards, but it was a good catch because this is a little bit, this is the first time I've seen them try to trick us. This is the first time I've seen the units change from the problems to the question. Uh, whereas in the problem, they state that it's in seconds, and then they ask about what it'll be after one minute. And I fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> um, so after 10 minutes, how will the colonies compare in size? So let me leave up most, we don't need that anymore. And I'm gonna erase that number and that number and that. And how many seconds is 10 minutes? Maybe. Yes. Maybe. In order to get after 10 minutes, we need to know how many seconds that is. Okay. How many seconds are in a minute? 60 seconds. Multiply by how many minutes you have? In in, uh, in the minutes we have. No, you just said that there were 60 here. Here's the way to kind of look at it. There are 60 seconds per minute. Mm -hmm. I'm labeling it like that. And I'm going to multiply that by 10 minutes. And notice what happens to the minutes. You can cancel units like that. And so what you end up with is 600 seconds. And whenever you're converting units, this is the way you want to do it. The reason is, is that by putting the units on there, you'll know whether multiplication is correct or do you need to divide. Sometimes you're going to need to divide. And the way you can always figure out the answer is just put the units on there and make sure the units cancel and you end up with the units you want. You wanted it in seconds and that's how many seconds it is. So now I got to go up here and I've got to square 600 seconds and I got to multiply that like that. And this is the same number of seconds and I got to do that. So now get your calculator out and, and come up with new answers for that. And even with this one, um, here, let me, let me help. I don't know if this helps you or hurts you, but to me, I'm gonna do this in two separate calculations. I'm gonna square 600. And what do I know? I know that six squared is 36. And when you square two zeros, you get four zeros. So that's what 600 squared is. Plus 2,400 plus four. Add those three numbers together on your calculator, making sure that you put four zeros after the 36. I will try that. I got six thousand four. Six thousand four. 
Uh, yeah, I messed you up. You know the answer has to be bigger than 360,000, right? G squared is 60 instead of 600. It's 600 squared, not 60 squared. Ah, okay. That would cause the two zeros to go away. 600 squared. Go back. Do 600 squared. Okay. Squared plus four times 600. Plus four. Uh, thirty-six thousand. No. It's okay. Yeah. Just give me the digits. You don't need to know what the. Just give me the digits. Okay. Three six two four zero four. Okay. And now let's look at that number. And if we put commas in there. That's 362,404. Talking about big numbers here, because that's what back that's what happens to bacteria. Notice how much it grew in 10 minutes. It went from just a, a few thousand in one minute to 362,000 because it's being squared. It's exponential growth. And then this one is 360,000 plus 1800 plus four. What does that give you? I can actually do this in my head. It's three, six, one, eight, zero, four. Large number. Yeah, again, less than the other one. Um, that bothers me that they did that um that that would encourage one to leave their food out <laughs> seriously i mean that that's not just a math mistake that's a mistake in teaching people about life <laughs> um all right let's see after a thousand minutes how will the colonies compare um Will one colony always have more bacteria? And yeah, we found out that the colder one always has more bacteria. Uh, and because no matter how long you wait, uh, the first term is the same on both of them. And the second term is always uh, greater on the 20 degree one because it's four times T as opposed to three times T. So um, you need an answer for this. Let's do it. So here we're going to do 1,000 squared. I'll put it in parentheses, even though I don't need to, because it's a number squared, um, plus 4 times 1,000 plus 4. That's the colder one, the 20-degree one. And the 30 degree one will be a thousand squared, which is that same number, which is a million. A thousand times a thousand is a million times three. So plus four. In other words, the only two difference in these polynomials is this middle term is times four in the top one, and it's times three in the bottom. So no matter what T is, the top one is always going to be bigger. Um, why don't you go ahead and well, let's see. I can probably do this one easier. And it's six zeros plus four thousand plus four. So this one, I know the four is gonna go in that spot right there. So I'm gonna write that and then a four and then two zeros and a four so it's still over a million but that red answer is the answer for the 20 degree one and for the 30 degree one we have a million plus three thousand plus four, and 
I know that that three has to go in that spot right there. So it's that and then three, zero, zero, four. So again, slightly more than a million for both, but the 20 degree one is still bigger. <coughs> All right. Two cars are driving towards each other along a straight road. I'll draw a little picture of it just so we can get an idea of what's happening here. So that car is going in that direction. And this car is going in this direction. They're driving towards each other. And the separation distance is L. So we'll call that distance right there L. From there to there. R1 and R2 are the speeds of the two cars. where L is the original separation distance. All right, if I were going to write that as an equation, then the words they say, separation distance, I'm going to say separation distance equals L minus R1 plus R2 times T. And that's an equation that will solve this problem. Why they use words for part of it and letters for the other, I will not understand. But this is what they're saying. The separation distance, which is S, is equal to their starting separation distance, which you'll notice that after a certain amount of time, these two cars are going to be moving closer to one another, and the separation distance is going to change. So the starting separation is not the ending separation. Um, so they ask uh, a question here, will the cars meet? Will they meet? Maylee, yeah. just think about it. You got two cars heading towards one another on a road. Are they going to meet? Yes, definitely. Absolutely, 100% of the time, unless one of them stops. But they've already told us that they're going at a speed of this. So neither one of them is going to stop. So yeah, yeah absolutely, they're going to meet. And a head-on crash. Okay. Yeah. Will they meet then? Let's see. What if they're going the same direction? Okay. Oh, oh no. the first question is when. Okay. So when will they meet? Never. When? No. They, we, we know that they will always meet the, the first situation. But what do we know about their separation distance when they do meet? How much is it? This. How far will they be separated when they have their head-on collision? Like a foot? No, like zero. Like zero? Yeah. So I'm going to set the separation distance to zero to solve this problem. And the original separation, which they didn't tell us what it was, so I still have to use letters. And they didn't tell us this. So now I have an equation that I have to solve. You have any equations? Well, yeah. I've set up an equation based on their, the way they stated the problem. The separation distance is. You can substitute an equal sign for the word is always. Um, and then I'm solving an equation. Well, I got a lot of variables here, so I can't solve it for a number. Uh, again, why they ask that, I don't know, but I can solve it for 
um, variables. And since they ask me to solve it when they will meet, I need to solve for t. So I'm going to take this equation down here and solve for this variable. Well, I can get rid of L, move it over to the other side. And now I have this. times t, and now I can get rid of the two minus signs because I'm just going to divide both sides by minus one. That gets rid of that and that. And now I need to solve for t, so I'm going to divide both sides by r1 plus r2. Who thought up these problems for eighth graders? I have no idea. Probably mathematicians. No, a teacher would start with a simple problem, not these ridiculous problems that they're giving us. Yeah. Where it's all variables. They didn't put any numbers in it or anything. I mean, that's the answer. That's when they will meet is if you, but you have to know what their speed are, the relative speeds of the two cars. And you have to know how far they were separated to begin with. And they didn't give us any of that information. So we can still come up with the answer, but it's going to be in terms of L, R, and R. So now the next part of the problem is, what if they're going in the same direction? So if they're going in the same direction, I'm going to reverse the direction that I have on that arrow. There. Now they are still separated by some L, but they're going in the same direction. And will they meet? Uh, we'll call this car number A, and we'll call this car number B. If A is going faster than B, in other words, if R2 is greater than R1, will they meet? If R2 is greater than R1, well, yeah, will still meet. No, they won't. Because R2 is going to the right faster than R than B is going to the right. Oh, uh, okay. So car A will just keep expanding the separation distance, the only way they will meet is if car B is going faster than car A, and then they will meet. And in other words, they will meet if R1 is greater than R2, and it doesn't have to be much greater. Is all it has to be is a tiny fraction amount greater, and after some length of time, they will eventually meet. But it requires the speed of the car that's behind to be greater than the speed of the car that's in front. Whereas when they're going towards each other, they're always going to meet regardless of who's going faster. Again, a nuance that's all right. Uh, we only have four minutes, but we can uh, we can do twenty one. I think in that amount of time. Yeah, we have like three minutes. We could do that one. Yeah, it's a pretty easy one actually. Uh, Enrique thinks that that polynomial has a degree of four. And based on this logic here, where it looks like he's adding all the exponents together. He's adding two to two to three. Uh, I don't know what he's doing, to be honest. But how do you determine the degree of a polynomial? The degree of a polynomial. Uh-huh. This is a polynomial. We went through this last time. How do you get the degree of a polynomial? Uh, 
First of all, it only has to do with the variables exponents, not the numbers. That is so confusing. I just, re I saw it. I see his mistake. I see his mistake. He, he, has a, he has a degree when there's no letter by the two. Exactly. So what is the degree of this polynomial? The, the degree of the polynomial, okay, two, four. If you have two letters that are the same, in other words, we have an X squared oh, wait, no, it's and two. an X, then you just, it's a two degree polynomial. That's two degrees. If I had a, a Y also, well, now you would have to consider the exponent of the Y and you would have to add two to one. But when you have an X squared and you also have an X to the one power, you don't add the exponents then. You take the maximum exponent of each new variable and add them together. So the degree is, there is no y in this thing. In fact, if I wanted to rewrite that, two squared is four. So it's four x squared. Two cubed is eight plus eight x. And two to the fourth power is 16. So if I wrote it like that, it's very clearly a two degree, a second degree polynomial. Based on that, and there's only one variable, x. Okay. Um, this one here is more than a couple of minute problem. So we'll wait and start it at our next session. Oh, it's very cold where you are. Huh? It's very cold where you are. It is, although it is. Oh, can you see my 37 degrees down here? Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I didn't realize you could see my task bar also. I thought it just showed you my uh, everything above the task bar. Yeah, this is like uh, 40 degrees warmer than it was yesterday. Oh. Yeah, it's been below zero here for like a week in uh, Denver, Colorado. So this is actually a warm up. All the snow that's in my backyard is uh, melting now because it's above freezing. 32 degrees is freezing. Oh, so that's good. That's that's good that it's warming up there. Yes, it is. It's always good to have that ice melting off my driveway also. Uh, here, let me look at tomorrow and see what you got scheduled for tomorrow uh looks like you have a 3 30 for tomorrow mm -hmm. so correct okay mm -hmm. i will see you then and um yeah hopefully the recording here will have some audio to it and if it does i'll send you an email as to how to get it perfect all right okay have, take care. Talk to you tomorrow. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.